many congratulations to the Prime team for this very uh, timely initiative. Uh, I think Prime has been very uh, consistently uh, doing this National Debt Conference for which they deserve all the praise. Um, and uh, I must also thank them that uh, for this year's uh, keynote address, they had invited uh, Dr. Nadeem ul uh, certainly uh, somebody who has, uh, uh, I had the honor of being mentored from. And uh, my own thinking, uh, of course, uh, was shaped as a result of a lot of work uh, that I was able to do uh, under his guidance uh, and advice. So really an honor uh, to be here uh, once again. Uh, let me just uh, uh, focus on three or four things because I guess that uh, uh, my colleague's presentation was really uh, very comprehensive and uh, congratulations for that. And uh, she's already touched upon those key uh, areas of uh, situation analysis, so I may not have to spend too much time over there, but I can jump maybe straight to the key debt management issues expectations from the recently announced supplementary finance bill and lessons from the debt strategies of other countries and I'll try to be as brief as possible. So uh, let me just sort of ground my discussion in the overall macroeconomic framework that we have. I understand that the growth outlook of 2018-19 uh, will see a cut. Uh, these are the numbers which I've uh, simply taken from the annual plan uh, of the Planning Commission. But of course, uh, given that this was an election year, there will be uh, a cut in the growth outlook. But that said, the two major problems of the macroeconomic framework still remain, which is the fiscal deficit as well as the current account deficit. And somehow or the other, one needs to have a short-term response and one also needs to have a longer-term response to both these uh, problems uh, going forward. Uh, we also see that the central uh, government uh, public debt, uh, while of course, as my colleague was saying, uh, remained, if I can say, quite disciplined between the years 2013 and 2015, 16 even, uh, given that there was a fund program and uh, we of course required the tranche at regular intervals and we did try to maintain the fiscal discipline, which would allow us to earn the next tranche. But as you see, uh, we move into 2017 and 2018, the short-term debt increases, uh, uh, particularly in the case of our uh, uh, domestic debt, where you see the green line uh, gradually uh, increasing upwards, you know. And it is this short-term debt that also impacts your uh, debt servicing uh, in the uh, longer term. Uh, one also sees that while, yes, and I agree, agree with my colleague, uh, 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 that uh, we, we saw in the earlier presentation that we may not be too much worried at this stage uh, with the size of the stock, with the size of the debt stock that we are carrying. There are other countries with uh, very similar economic profiles who may have a higher debt level uh, than Pakistan. But what I would be worried about is the debt servicing capacity, whether I'll be able to pay that debt or not. In that context, uh, I would be a little worried given that my uh, debt servicing to GDP ratio as well as debt servicing to revenue uh, in percentage terms hasn't been improving much. Uh, one could easily argue that these two indicators uh, are, are not true representatives of sustainability indicators. So I have another chart here which tells you uh, whether external account in, is, is, is going to be helping the debt capacity uh, or not. And uh, we, 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 we try to sort of see the two key foreign exchange uh, sources uh, that you can use, which is export earnings and workers' remittances. These are the two key sources that you can uh, sort of uh, help sustain your external uh, debt procurement capacity. Uh, in, in case of both, you see that uh, remittance growth, in fact, was on a decline in 2017. We have seen some uptick this year. Uh, but not to the tune of uh, where we were in 2015. Similarly, in case of exports to D GDP ratio, unfortunately, we are down to single digits when it comes to the share of exports in our uh, GDP. And that also means that external account may not be able to help you too much in the longer term. One can use the standard sustainability ratios, which is the external debt uh, times the foreign exchange earnings ratio, foreign exchange reserves ratio, 
or external debt servicing as percentage of foreign exchange earnings. In case of both, of course, uh, you can see a declining capacity when, when you look at the blue line, which is external debt to foreign exchange reserves. Uh, but uh, even in case of external debt servicing to foreign exchange earnings, there isn't much of a solace there. So, uh, so, so, so the key question that I would be worried about would be the future debt servicing capacity, whether I can repay the debt uh, or not. Uh, so if I was to come jump straight to the drivers of current stock of debt, uh, I can classify into four basically. Uh, first is uh, we, uh, we, we are generating less than anticipated uh, revenue, uh, at least uh, on, on the fiscal side. Second, of course, uh, our budget is framed, structured, uh, with the assumptions that provinces will throw up surpluses. And provinces say that after the 18th Amendment, we are under no bounds to throw surpluses. So you've seen increased provincial spending. And then there are pressures on federal government current expenditures, which continue to remain uh, mainly driven by things like the losses of public sector enterprises, as well as circular debt that exists in energy as well as commodity operations. You're also seeing high foreign currency denominated public debt, which is now up at somewhere around 30% approximately. Uh, one uh, going forward, of course, uh, uh, and of course this is a personal opinion, that factors that could keep the public debt ratio significantly high, perhaps as high as 75% in violation of fed, uh, fiscal debt and uh, fiscal responsibility and debt limitation law. Uh, these factors could include uh, the negative shocks to the real sector growth, uh, rise in global oil prices, rise in unit prices of imports uh, for essential inputs, uh, something which, of course, uh, Dr. Manzoor has all, had, had also written in his recent op-ed, of course, uh, given that uh, global oil prices could push uh, other aspects as well. There could be adverse exchange rate shocks. Uh, contingent liabilities arising from losses of public sector enterprises may be growing. Uh, while all this is there uh, on the table, uh, and, and, and this is something that will worry any finance minister, uh, the ministry has been issuing long-term guarantees to public sector enterprises for procuring more debt. So in the past one year, you see that WABDA, PHPL, SUI Northern Gas, ZTBL, PIA, SUI Southern, NTDC, NHA, all were issued uh, an NOC to get more debt, uh, basically, you know. And most of these, I would argue, are loss-making entities, uh, uh, just like... Uh, if, if I have to go back to Dr. Nadeem's example where he was talking about the balance sheet issue, which is a, a fundamental concern to us. Uh, now, as my colleague said, the, uh, the Fiscal Responsibility and Debt Limitation Act, which is a rule-based policy uh, to prevent this sort of doing whatever we are doing uh, when it comes to debt uh, mismanagement, uh, this act was amended uh, with the goal to make it more strict, basically, where federal government budget deficit should be reduced at 4% of GDP uh, during the period 2018 to 20, and 3.5% thereafter. Similarly, public debt shall be reduced to 60%. Uh, while this promise is very good, I would like to ask myself the question as student of economics, that why is it that we made a law, couldn't follow it, amended it to our own ease, still cannot follow it. So the, so my next three or four slides uh, try to answer if uh, the fiscal responsibility and debt limitation law is delivering. My first uh, way of explaining that it is not delivering is that at this point of time, today, if you and I go to the Ministry of Finance and ask somebody, what is the fiscal deficit? Nobody really knows, you know. So Mr. Asad Umar, in his speech on supplementary finance bill, uh, said uh, what I'm trying to display over here uh, with some numbers. I understand that a similar effort was also done by a business recorder. So he says that according to the Ministry of Finance prior to May, that Ministry of Finance, they had said that the budget deficit to GDP ratio is 4.9%. Uh, and he says that that Ministry of Finance was lying. Why were they lying? Because he says that there is a revenue shortfall of $350 billion. 
This is an expenditure which was understated in Mif Mr. Mr. Mifta Ismail's budget by 250 billion rupees. He also says that provinces were supposed to run surpluses, which they won't. Uh, so you lose 286 billion. And then he says that there's circular debt in energy, which the government did not show above the line. They showed it below the deficit line, you know. So according to the current finance minister, the actual deficit to GDP ratio comes to somewhere around 8.5%. Uh, and this hasn't been published by the Ministry of Finance on their website because they're not clear about this calculation. Uh, and the ambition now is, according to the amendments which have been made in the supplementary finance bill, that the government will try to reduce it from 8.5 to 5.2% through an additional tax effort, PSDP cut, and reduction in tax exemptions. So, so, so whatever is happening over here, that is besides the point. My only argument is that my ministry uh, or, or the government needs to have better mechanism to know what's the loss uh, at, at one point in time uh, so that you can have better debt management in place. My second slide on whether FRDL is delivering or not, uh, I believe that uh, within the law, there are weak demand and supply side accountability measures which need to be part of the law. The parliament could only weakly challenge the amendments twice brought on the floor during 2017. Uh, any government now has the ability to change the definitions of basic debt concepts which are enshrined in this law. Uh, the PMLN changed the definition of public debt twice during their tenure uh, and the law allowed them to do that. Uh, another example is from 2016 and I, I, I said this uh, uh, where I think Dr. Vakar Masood was there uh, during the, 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 the past meeting that in 2016 given that you didn't have the correct numbers uh, we were not able to correctly forecast our deficit financing needs we want, went on to borrow more than what was required by the Ministry of Finance suddenly in June Ministry of Finance realized that we had borrowed more. We don't need this much for the next two quarters. What did the Ministry of Finance do? They ended up putting that money into the commercial banks on an interest rate which was much lower than the borrowed cost. Now, my only question is, who paid for the differential? Yes, taxpayer paid, but nobody was penalized, right? For just a process that can be improved. Uh, now, uh, just three slides uh, to break it down that what are the weaknesses at the Ministry of Finance which is responsible for debt management. I'll just focus on institutional weaknesses. Mm -hmm. First, there is very fragmented management across three units in Ministry of Finance. First is the budget wing. Second is some part of debt is being dealt by Central Directorate of National Savings. Some decisions are being taken by Debt Policy Coordination Office. Now, all three offices within a single ministry have very different visions about where uh, the borrowing requirement is going. What are they borrowing for, basically? What is the motive for future for creating future debt? The DPCO uh, lacks an active role in the management of debt and vulnerabilities, and debt sustainability analysis lacks evaluation. Second, if you look at, uh, of course, this was for domestic debt issues. My This slide is for external debt management. In case of external debt management, the problem is far more basic. You ask any uh, good, decent officer in the Ministry of Finance, uh, what is the objective of Pakistan's external debt? Why do we go for external debt, you know? Uh, they really don't know whether it is for national development needs or to meet the forex requirement. So my humble submission is that first of all, there needs to be a vision in place. Why am I continuing to procure on uh, the domestic debt and only then we would uh, make a case for the narrative which Dr. Nadeemul Haq was talking about. Why am I going back to begging again and again? Uh, second, there are arguments uh, from the provincial governments which we recently saw in the Council of Common Interests where provinces are asking the Prime Minister, look, we should be allowed to procure our own loans, our own grants. We should be independent to discuss with our own development partners and they complain regarding the stifling role of economic affairs division in this process. Then there are arguments from autonomous bodies within the government who are saying that we want to procure our own loans, our own debt. Why? Because any commercially viable entity, may it be PIA, WABDA, if it 
really operates on a commercial basis, it, it should be allowed to raise bonds from international or local sources. But what they are saying is that we can't commercially manage ourselves because the approval procedures do not keep pace with the debt market. There are cumbersome procedures for rescheduling of debt. I recently saw uh, one of the officials of a public enterprise trying to get hold of his next tranche of uh, bond repayment going from one additional secretary to another and he said there are 11 offices you know so even the autonomous bodies cannot manage their own external debt portfolios i've tried to give certain proposals uh, uh, on how frdl law can be improved and all what i'm saying uh, can can be rectified to an extent in the shorter term to start with provinces need to agree on their own rule-based policy. Just having a fiscal responsibility law at the federal government won't solve the issue. We need provincial governments to bind, uh, to promise to a provincial fiscal policy rule as well. Uh, second, there should be a penalty clause for federal or provincial government who breaches the FRDL. Currently, there is no penalty uh, clause over there. The monitoring system to effectively review and monitor progress in debt including contingency management in the context of rolling medium-term macroeconomic framework is missing. And, and just to bring in one of the favorite examples of Dr. Nadeem, uh, that currently you have three or four different macroeconomic frameworks, different Excel spreadsheets at the Ministry of Finance, at the Planning Commission, at the State Bank. All very three macroeconomic frameworks of Pakistan, and the pro projections don't tell you, you know. So, 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 so th there has to be some shared vision on that long-term macroeconomic framework. The optimal debt stock should be in line with economic growth requirements. Uh, something about which my colleague uh, Dr. Sajid Amin has been writing about in his op-eds. Also, we need to allow redefinition of fiscal rules on the line similar to the 2005 law. Uh, and uh, the OGP, uh, Open Government Partnership Framework, can certainly facilitate that. And then finally, if you have a debt policy coordination office in Ministry of Finance, you need to revisit its role. It needs to have a role in determining the cash requirements. Currently, the only role that, that the poor office performs is to issue uh, a debt policy statement, which is a document of 28 pages on the website. Uh, so my final uh, uh, segment of the presentation is that what lessons can we learn from countries which have recently graduated from their borrowing programs basically. So I take, uh, I start with the South Asian countries where, uh, which have been extensively studied in these studies which uh, I'm, I'm citing. Uh, we see that debt increase growth uh, after a certain point did adversely impact economic growth in these countries even if this debt was procured for infrastructure. If there was an overhang for longer periods, there was an inverted U-shaped relationship uh, between debt and growth. The most important channel through which higher debt levels were impacting uh, growth negatively were public and private investment. Uh, the growth of debt led to expectations of lesser returns. Uh, also, the local investors were expecting taxes to return uh, that debt, whereas the foreign investors were expecting longer-term uncertainty. Uh, we also see in cases where uh, there were default chances that uh, the, the probability of default in economies, particularly emerging market economies, uh, grew when low growth equilibrium was uh, coupled with sustained high rates of external debt. Uh, thankfully, we don't have that exposure uh, currently uh, in case of Pakistan's budget. The default rates were also lower in the case of domestic rather than external debt. And external defaults did trigger domestic defaults, something which, of course, we need to be careful about when it comes to CPEC-related debt, as you were showing us. Uh, we also see that the quality of political regime matters, and we now have tools uh, which can determine or at least hold the political regime accountable uh, under both scenarios, scenario of debt overhang, scen scenario where government's borrowing crowds out the private sector, or a combination of two which we actually saw between the periods of 2007 and 2012. Now, how successful economies use debt, there are three uh, very common things. First, they used the key channels, they, they identified the key channels through which growth can be helped, which was total factor productivity, 
uh, as Dr. Nadeem was hinting at, investment, which could be public and private investment, interest rate, and the savings channel. Uh, successful economies tightly linked their debt procurement with external levers of growth, which is exports, FDI, and productivity. The borrower's capacity to service debt was also increased over time. They also closely monitored the channels through which debt will impact growth. But there were also some institutional policies that complement prudent management, debt management. And of course, there was a discussion about how nations fail. Uh, and of course, many of those features are discussed over there as well. In the success stories that we see in 15 emerging market economies, governments strictly use debt for developing the most essential infrastructure and only in the short term. Debt from local sources was kept under check in order not to reduce loanable funds for the private sector. Own tax revenues were generated to help investments in social sectors. Structural problems which created sovereign losses were addressed. And the size of the shadow economy was reduced through policy as well as administrative uh, measures. The two additional things which mattered, uh, these economies were also learning regarding how international creditors force domestic creditors to share the burden. For example, in the case of CPEC arrangement for energy products uh, uh, projects, it's, it's not the government of Pakistan uh, which can be uh, sort of uh, uh, burdened uh, through those loans, uh, at least uh, in, in theoretical terms. It's the consumer who will see the burden uh, for the next uh, uh, three decades, given that uh, the CPEC related a financial commitment with China has been inserted in the consumer bills, in the electricity and gas bills, through which the uh, compensation for nine early harvest projects of CPEC would be cleared. Uh, and as I said, while quality of political regime uh, does matter a lot, but you have frameworks such as the Open Government Partnership, which can hold the elected representatives responsible, uh, in the uh, particularly in the context of strengthening the FRDL uh, Act. And I'll stop over here. Thank you very much.